Hello everyone, I call myself Zondaskind and I love playing Civilization 6 with the Heroes and Legends mode enabled. The hero units can really liven up your game by helping you to survive an early war or starting an early economical snowball. But of course, with such strong abilities, there are big differences between the units and I have put them into a tier list for you. Rather than have tiers S through F, I'm bringing it back to S through C. Not just because there are only 12 units and they can all be excellent at their time, but also so you can compare it with the tier list that Potato McWhiskey made shortly after the Heroes and Legends mode initially launched. I remembered him in the back of the head using four tiers and looked back at his video after I'd done my initial ranking. Without spoiling too much, the differences between our ratings are in the details. In any case, if you hadn't seen this video yet, do give it a watch, it's just as applicable as it was when they initially uploaded it. Also, the data that MoProps collected on Heroes Unit's combat strengths was helpful to me in the script writing phase, go watch his video as well. And I'd like to shout out Comreal, who made some b-roll footage just for this video. What I bring to the table is tips on specific synergies and, of course, slides! I play my games on standard speed, deity difficulty, single player, and I've used Heroes and Legends for all different victory conditions. These slides show you a unit's icon, portrait, and unique relic, and I try to base my rating on how useful I find their movement, attack type, and special ability. I'll preface here that I really like economical abilities because they are useful in all games, whereas combat abilities are useful specifically for domination and or war heavy games. Even economical abilities that are on their own weaker than combat abilities are still useful no matter if I'm never at war or always at war, whereas combat abilities get better the more you go to war. Having said all that, let's get started with Anansi, a hero in Legends from the Akan people in modern day Ghana. He is agile, meaning he ignores movement penalties in woods and rainforests. He is classed as a ranged unit with a one tile range, and his special ability is Anansi's Tricks. Six times, he can remove a bonus or luxury resource and turn it into a science and culture boost. You can do this in your own land, but also in neutral or even a non-allied opponent's territory. The economic boost is amazing, especially early on. In the ancient era, he gets you a total of 360 signs and 300 culture. For reference, all the ancient era texts and civics combined require 565 signs and 340 culture. While his ability does scale, your own signs and culture outputs will scale harder than he does. It's also really nice to be able to remove a luxury in order to get that perfect campus or government plaza configuration. His only weakness, but it is a big one, is his combat abilities. While other economical heroes are still good in war games, he is straight up the worst unit. Just as we give Sucker Horse Archers and Crouching Tigers flack for their one tile range, Anansi's attack types is the worst of the heroes. And when I have to fight against heroes, Anansi is the one that scares me the least. Therefore, I give him a B tier. Anansi has pretty interesting synergies with the Maori and Babylon. The Maori would normally not be able to remove bonus resources, so while I usually send out Anansi into neutral or enemy territory, in a Maori game he is very useful for getting rid of resources in your own territory. For Babylon, the 50% science per turn debuff doesn't apply to Anansi's charges, so his charges have twice the impact and can help getting you through the unboostable technologies much faster. Moving on to Arthur, a legendary king of Britain. He has 5 movement but no special abilities to ignore terrain. Classed as a heavy cavalry unit, his ability Arthur's Accolade can transform 4 other units into questing knights, a special heavy cavalry unit with a lifespan of 12 turns whose combat strength depends on the era. Starting at 34 in the ancient era, just below a horseman's 36, they gain a flat plus 12 every era. I'm always a little reticent to use that ability, at least on my standing army, since I don't want to lose them after 12 turns. If I need extra combat strength, I don't exactly feel great about knowing I'm only borrowing that strength. It almost feels like you're levying your own troops and losing the suzerainty halfway through. Since Arthur isn't rugged or agile, most other heroes can actually keep up with his movement, and for all civs but one, as a cavalry unit, he is ineffective against walled cities. It stands to reason that Arthur works best with civs that have combat bonuses for cavalry units, like Genghis Khan's Mongolia. 
but the bigger synergy of course is with Bezel the Second's Byzantium. Getting a couple of scouts out and turning them into wall busting questing knights is the strongest strategy for Arthur and should be sufficient to dispose of your closest opponent as long as you're able to convert their cities. Beowulf is the Scandinavian protagonist from the eponymous Old English poem, his rugged movement lets him run more quickly over hills and he is the first of six melee units on this list. His special ability is Beowulf's Challenge and it can be used six times to instantly destroy a unit with less combat strength than him, which is functionally anything, and can be used against garrisoned units as well. But I'm going to give it to you straight. I do not like Beowulf. Deity difficulty single player is just a rough environment for him. Having six units deleted would be debilitating for a human player, but the AI basically brush it off in a turn or two. Before long, Beowulf will be fighting in the melee, and there's no economic benefit to him, so you're guaranteed to be at war. And even his combat strength is worse than Heracles. While I can't deny that he saved me from a loss a couple times, he's disappointed me at least as many times and drops into C tier. Beowulf synergies are a lot less specific. His biggest use case is actually on the defense, as an emergency handbrake to make the AI reconsider their life choices. On the offense, saves that want to get to conquering cities rather than having to deal with units like him best. I'm thinking of Julius Caesar's Rome or Macedon, since the faster they can conquer cities, the better. Getting rid of garrisoned units and the reinforcements the AI brings out can help you take cities faster, which helps you get the gold boost for Kaiser or Eurekas and inspirations for Alexander that you seek. And as a little extra, deleting other heroes with Beowulf is very funny. On we go with the Greco-Roman hero Heracles aka Hercules. Like Beowulf, he is a rugged, i.e. hill-ignoring melee unit. While he officially has 6 charges which you can use for his rage ability, eh, just forget about that nonsense, and instead use his labor ability 3 times to instantly complete any district, no matter the production needed. Heracles is my favorite hero and single-handedly makes me return to the game mode every so often. He is also probably the hero I revive the most. The amazing economical benefit of not having to worry about your first couple of splendid districts, instantly plopping down your primary district or harbors in far-flung settlements, and of course the time he saves you on spaceports in science game would be amazing even if he was a civilian unit. But wait, there's more! He's actually got the highest melee combat strength of all the heroes! If I ever say he's not in S tier, please call the police on me. Heracles is amazing on any Civ, but he gets really awesome on Civs that do have bonuses to district adjacencies, think Japan, but no bonuses towards district production, thinking of Australia and the Netherlands in particular. The extra district slot that Germany gets makes Heracles super interesting for both Friedrich and Ludwig. Don't use him on the half-cost Hansas though, maybe use him on the commercial hubs boosting them, or once you get there of course, for the spaceports in whatever cities can produce them in 10 turns or less. Moving from the Mediterranean to Japan, we meet the shamaness queen Himiko, our only civilian class hero. Her swift movement ignores all-terrain penalties and she specifically also ignores closed borders. She has 8 charges that she can use on her charm or rule abilities. Charm places a free envoy in a city-state and gives you faith if you were already the suzerain, and rule levies the troops of the city-state without spending a dime. Additionally, she passively gives 5 combat strength to units within 2 tiles just like a great general would. I won't pretend to keep the suspense going, Himiko is easily an S-tier unit as well. Sure. Himiko cannot fight herself, but with her charm ability she can get more units on your side, with her rule ability she can bring them under your control, and she also passively makes those units stronger. Envoys are ultimately a limited resource in the game, so unlocking an 8 pack of them is really good, and since Himiko can generate faith, the resource you need to revive her, she actively makes it easier to turn that 8 pack into a 16 pack or an entire beer crate of envoys. I specifically like picking up Himiko with Georgia, because once you get a religion with Papal Primacy, you can get 3 envoys off of 1 Himiko charge with Diplomatic League, making you a city-state juggernaut. 
But the even stronger synergy is with Hungary, as she can levy the city-states at no cost, also triggering two envoys, and give even more strength to the insane buffs Hungarian levied units get. It's a synergy to reroll for, and both the game mechanic and Bosius have playlists demonstrating its full potential. Our second Greek hero is Hippolyta, or Hippolyta, another rugged unit ignoring the hills. Uniquely, she is an anti-cavalry class unit, which changes how she fights against melee and cavalry units. Passively, she heals 20 HP every turn, and she can use her command ability every turn as well, replenishing the movement of an adjacent unit of your choice, be they combat civilian or air units. I find Hippolyta's use case a little limited, while you could in theory use her in a pacifist game to move around your settlers and builders, and she wouldn't be a bad defensive unit, she does really shine in military offensives. She is really good at maintaining your momentum in them, especially once siege units enter the battlefield. However, compared to the higher ranked heroes, I don't want to recruit her in as many games, and her B tier reflects it. Hippolyta can make scary units even scarier. Just imagine a Vietnamese Voi Chen darting up to your city from the forest, shooting, getting Hippolyta's command to shoot again, and then they can just retreat into the fog of war before you can respond. But most of all, I love Hippolyta as a siege unit captain, so the biggest Hippolyta fan in my opinion is Kanuni Suleiman's Ottomans, as Hippolyta belligerently brings better bombards barreling bifold on boundary burrows. You will march through enemy territory in no time with her help. I am only going to try once to pronounce the names of these Mayan heroes correctly. Hunachpu and Spalanke. Henceforth the twins. Their agile movement ignores woods and rainforests, they class as a melee unit, and they could in theory infinitely benefit from the twins' resurrection, as they convert any unit they kill into a fully healed unit on your side, which can include unique units. In practice though, expect to pick up like a half dozen of generic units. For a unit whose ability relies on getting into combat, the twins are actually a little squishy, and a barbarian raid can be enough to overwhelm them. While their potential is amazing, one day I want to pick up legions off of a miscalculating Roman AI, they usually fall short of that and linger in B tier for that reason. To unlock the full potential of the twins without feeling bad about their squishiness, I'd recommend trying them out with civs that either have combat strength bonuses like Rough Rider Teddy's America, or civs that have bonuses to relics. Specifically, Poland does like to do a bit of war, but doesn't necessarily mind when the twins die and the relic give Poland extra gold, culture and faith. Polynesian mythology brings us the story of Maui, and the game gives him agile movement to ignore woods and rainforests. He fights as a melee unit and can use his inventions ability four times to spawn a bonus or luxury resource on neutral territory, sometimes blocked by undiscovered strategic resources. Consulting the wiki to reference which resources can spawn on which terrain types can really help getting the resources you're looking for, or if he does find a strategic resource, predict which one it's going to be. I'm sure that my bias towards economic benefits is shining through here, but Maui is one of my favorite heroes. Especially on larger maps, being able to add luxury resources to your map, adding adjacencies to planned harbor spots, and making desert and tundra tiles workable is a lot of fun. Even if I might agree with you if you say that it's a long-term benefit, rather than some other hero's abilities kicking in earlier. And maybe he'd need at least one more charge to truly deserve that A tier rating I'm giving him. But, you know, having abundant resources is always great and some save have bonuses specifically around resources or specific improvements. To name two of them, Ptolemy Cleopatra's Egypt will get extra food and culture on the resource that Maui adds on to the floodplains, and for the Maya, the observatory can actually become a good campus by trying to add plantation resources to the tiles around them. I hope you forgive me for using the Mongolian theme for Mulan, the theme of her enemy, but she's one of two Chinese heroes so I'm leaving the Chinese theme for Sun Wukong. Her five movement points aren't modified to ignore terrain, like Arthur, and she is a ranged cavalry unit with a two-tile range. Her abilities, Mulan's Defiance and Devotion, are passive abilities fortifying her at the end of every turn and increasing her combat strength a point per turn. 
she can get crazy strong, especially if you can lengthen her lifespan with the shrine. Mulan is probably the unit I fear opposing the most, because she's probably the most capable combat unit, raining down hellfire while staying fortified in the second line. She's so strong that you can even use her as an honorary trebuchet. And if the war that you recruited her for ends, she's still mobile enough to operate as a barbarian hunter. The Tuta range is the big reason I consider her far better than Anansi in combat and put her in A tier. Picking off enemy units is what Mulan does best, and so you might want to use her with saves that get bonuses towards or from that. The Mapuche's combat bonuses make them a very happy Mulan customer, but I want to shout out Gorgo's Grease here as they get extra culture from the kills that Mulan gets, and they also buff her combat strength ever so slightly with every red card you slot in. Oya is a hero from Yoruba traditions in modern Nigeria and other West African countries. She has only 3 movement points but does ignore all terrain penalties thanks to being swift and fights as a melee unit. She can conjure up her storm 6 times, healing your own units and damaging enemy units next to her by 40 points. I think Oya is the hero I've recruited the least. The potential health point swing she can make is astronomical. In theory, if every charge hits 6 adjacent units, that's a 1440 HP swing, that's 14 entire units. But it depends on the AI moving in a way that's conducive to that, and not just focusing fire on her and killing her, since she doesn't heal herself. Sadly, she's never the worst hero I could get, but also never the best, so I always just get someone else. And she often just falls by the wayside, and consequently falls into C tier on this list. Oya doesn't have huge synergies with any particular civs, because having healthy units face damage ones is always good, but Scythia does like it a little more than others, and can use the kills to heal further. Meanwhile, Gaul and Sultan Saladin's Arabia like the battlefields to be as big as possible to get the extra support and flanking bonuses, so fitting Oya into their armies will gel a little better with what they like to do anyway. A late addition to the 1001 Knights, the Baghdadi Sailor Sinbad is the only naval hero with 7 movement points that he can immediately spend on sailing the ocean's blue. He classes as a naval melee unit and has 2 gold garnering abilities. Passively, he gets a flat 400 gold throughout the game for discovering natural wonders and new continents, and 8 times he can use his fortunes ability. The gold from this does scale up, 200 in the ancient era, 300 in the classical, add 100 per era. And it also plunders a barbarian outpost or takes 50 HP off of an enemy naval unit. Sinbad is hit or miss. If you're on a land map, forget about him. If you're on an ocean map, re-roll for him. His abilities don't scale amazingly into the late game, like don't re-recruit him in the industrial era, but recruiting him early and re-recruiting him at least once can supercharge a game insanely well. For reference, 8 times 200 gold is enough for 6 monuments. It's enough for 4 quaterims. You can buy a university and an amphitheater off of that. Of course, for synergy with Simbad, I have to look to the naval civs. Portugal wants to discover everyone quickly and his extra sight makes it easier for Simbad to do so. And the extra gold lets him buy him amazing traders or settlers and get the game going. Kung Ahalat's Norway straight up gives Simbad an extra ability to also raid coastal tiles, so you don't have to wait 100 turns to pick up that tribal village that Simbad finds on a faraway continent. Finally, our second Chinese hero and sixth melee unit is the Monkey King Sun Wukong. He has 6 points of swift movement ignoring all terrain penalties and his special abilities are both passive. Disguise keeps him hidden from non-adjacent units and Immortality keeps him alive for 50 turns rather than the usual 30. In his tier list, Potato McWhiskey called Sun Wukong a land submarine because of his movement and stealth. And based on how I use him, I basically use him to pillage a lot, I can call him a Stone Age Courser. I would add that the two thirds extra lifespan just make him an amazing hero to get early and hunt for barbarians, scout around, do whatever to get sight of the map. I've also become more fond of that war and pillage gameplay lately, so he might even move into S tier at some point, but for now, 
I'm content giving him an A tier rating since he's not as reroll worthy in strictly peaceful games. Sun Wukong is so all round that assigning him to his favorite Civ almost feels like pigeonholing him, but I'd like to shout out Sumer's ability in the Heroes and Legends mode that gave him even more of an extended lifespan, he'll basically be around for half your game. And uh, Gran Colombia and Vietnam's extra movement make him dart across the map even more like a madman. You should easily be able to get a Golden Age off of the Civs, Barbarians and Natural Wonders he discovers for you. So there's the rating, 3 heroes in every tier with Heracles, Himiko and Simbad at the top and Arthur, Beowulf and Oya at the bottom. Do you agree with me or did I overlook someone's ability? Please let me know in the comments. Meanwhile, like the video if you liked it, it helps to attract more eyes. The next tier list will be one of unique units, so expect that near the end of April. And subscribe and ding the bell if you want to be notified when my playlists and tier lists like these go live. We will see you then. Bye bye.